Hello and welcome. It's time. The NCAA tournament is less than 24 hours away, and we're here for the NCAA tournament preview as part of the Road to the Final Score presented by Bet365. I'm Charlie DeCirco alongside Mike Calabrese, Anthony DeBundo, Stucky's dialing in remote. We'll hear from Nick Giffen and Sean Kerner on the round of 64 player props to target later in the show, as well as Dano Mattia on the women's side of things. Coming up on this show, we're going to break down our favorite future of the entire NCAA tournament, our favorite side and total of the round of 64, and give you our final four and championship preview, all four of us here. But I do want to remind everybody that the road to the final score is presented by Bet365. Bet365 doesn't do ordinary. That's why you get more boosts with them than with anyone else. Bet365 boosts specific markets, your winnings, and even parlays. And they don't stop there. College basketball showpiece competition takes place this month. And if you can correctly pick, predict the outcome of every game with Bet365, you will scoop a top prize of $10 million. There's also a cool 100,000 up for grabs for the player who scores the most points throughout the NCAA tournament as well. Make sure you join Bet365 and play your bracket for free before opening round one game tips off. It's never ordinary at Bet365. 21 plus only or 18 plus in Kentucky and present in Arizona, Colorado, Indiana, Iowa, Kentucky, Louisiana, New Jersey, North Carolina, Ohio, or Virginia. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa. Terms and conditions and restrictions apply. So let's take a look at the Sweet 16 odds right now. This is how bettors are attacking the future market. No surprise here, NC State, one of the most popular teams as far as ticket goes. They lost 7 of 9 to end the regular season and then ripped off 5 of 5 to win the ACC tournament. McNeese State and Will Wade, a popular upset pick as well. They draw Gonzaga in the first round before facing the winner of Kansas Sanford, Kansas without Kevin McCullough Jr. And North Carolina, both as far as tickets and handle goes, a popular pick to escape the opening weekend. So guys, let's keep in mind our favorite futures here. Since 2002, I do want to say Ken Palm track data since that time. And every single champion aside from 2014 UConn finished in the top 25 in offensive and defensive efficiency. Those eight teams right now as it stands, UConn, Houston, Purdue, Arizona, Auburn, UNC, Creighton, and Marquette. Stuck, I'm going to start with you first. Your favorite future in this entire NCAA tournament. Uh, I'm a stubborn man, so I, I've been saying Houston is going to win it all for a while, so I'm sticking with that, but I do like them to win their region, and I think that they got a really good draw here. Of all the number one seeds, you really couldn't ask for a more favorable draw. If you just look at some of the injury questions many of the teams have, getting the four Duke, who I just think if Duke gets there, and you know, obviously assuming Houston does as well to the Sweet 16, Duke struggles with physicality. Well, there's no one more physical than Houston, so I think that's a terrible matchup for the Blue Devils. I also just don't trust Kentucky's defense to carry them all the way to the Final Four. Historically, teams that profile similar to the Wildcats just generally don't make deep runs so i'm gonna trust this houston defense i'm gonna trust jamal shed sampson and that physicality to get to the final four i like houston to win their region yeah samson finally looking to cut down the nets there and i'm curious guys uh, i'll kick to you calabrese your thoughts on houston as a whole i know jawan roberts obviously injured playing through that played the games in the in the big 12 tournament do you think that this is going to loom large for Houston altogether, or do you see them kind of cakewalking through as well? I think Samson just kind of shut down both Roberts and Francis in the game against Iowa State, not necessarily because they couldn't have gone, but more so at that point, they already had the number one seed locked up. Why risk another injury? And even though they lose a guy like Tugler and Arsenal earlier in the season, I still think their, you know, let's call it the eight-man rotation they're putting out on the floor is capable of playing historically good defense. So if you want to hit your wagon to a team that's going to string wins together, you could do a lot worse than picking one of the best defenses in the last decade. Yeah, this was, I think, the conference or the region that I had the most difficulty with altogether. I thought that, you know, Houston, obviously the best in the region, but Kentucky – there's something about the Wildcats and their offense, but obviously, ultimately, the defense is its, is its Achilles heel, as you know, Stucky pointed out earlier. Debondo, I'm going to go to you for your favorite future next. Where are you looking for this NCAA tournament? 
one thing about Houston, I think their floor is so high. When they dominate turnover margin like they do, when they dominate rebounds like they do, it's really hard to yeah. upset them. You need to run really hot shooting-wise like Miami did last year to pull that off. So I think Houston's a pretty high floor pick. I'm going to go with another team that I, I think is uh, a dark horse here, and that is New Mexico, plus 275 to make the Sweet 16. If you've watched any of our shows this week, you know I've been a fan of the Lobos. Of course, we've had multiple conversations about, well, how do they play outside of the pit? How do they play when they're not at elevation? Well, we did just see them run through the Mountain West Conference Tournament and took a lot of market respect and close as a favorite uh, in the quarterfinal and semifinal game and then beat San Diego State, a team that has dominated the Mountain West for a while now, in that final. And what I was really impressed by was when it came down to those final handful of possessions, having the guards that they do with Mashburn and House, Denton was sick for the game, having those guys that can get anywhere and take advantage of teams in ball screens uh, was really impressive. And at San Diego State team, that's hard to take down uh, ball screen defense wise so I was impressed by that and I think they get a pretty favorable matchup here with Clemson who has two guards in the backcourt who do not grade out well defensively uh, and I think they have the advantage in uh, shot volume as well over Clemson because of their elite turnover differential Clemson not a team that's gonna force a lot of turnovers and then the potential second round matchup with Baylor you look at the draw there Baylor elite shot making offense but they're not a good turnover margin team their rebounding is inconsistent and as a result, New Mexico has a shot volume advantage over them as well. So, you know, Baylor has the NBA guards. They have the talent. But New Mexico is going to be right there with them, probably close three, three-and-a-half-point underdogs. So they're going to be in the mix. So at plus 275, I like the Lobos to make the Sweet 16. It's interesting, right? So they win their conference tournament. Basically, the committee saying that they didn't win. They probably would not have made this field. They enter this game. They're favored against Clemson. When that's happened, it's very, it's happened not so often, but when there's a five seed difference or more and that that team that's the higher seed is the underdog, two 13 and one against the spread. So does not bode well for Clemson in general. And then as you mentioned, New Mexico go then possibly drawing and likely drawing Baylor. Doesn't seem like Colgate has quite enough. Stuck, I'm curious with you too, um, what your thoughts on New Mexico in general, your thoughts on them potentially making out of it first weekend. Yeah, I'm not sure how they're going to make the Sweet 16 or the... I think one of you guys has them in the Final Four if they're going to lose to Clemson. But uh, get ready to learn zone, New Mexico, because <laughs> you're probably going to see it a lot in the first two rounds, assuming you get by Clemson. I think Clemson's going to go zone. Obviously, Baylor has gone about 50% zone over the past few weeks, and I think they'll, they'll go even a higher percentage against New Mexico if that is the matchup. And... I think that potentially could be effective in slowing the Lobos down. So, um, yeah, I have I have no interest in New Mexico here. Yeah. Well, I want to throw one more stat out there. So there's the sixth 11th seed in history. This is from Will Warren. Sixth 11th seed in history to have a plus 10 shot volume margin over their opponent. Those teams were 4-1 and one in the first round. Uh, and, of course, the market likes them. They have a high lofty power rating. You know, zone offense could be a concern. There's not a ton of jump shooting from the perimeter, especially for New Mexico. Uh, but I just trust their guards to get to the rim uh, against uh, Clemson. Yeah, the sophomore year leap that Donovan Dent definitely had had this past season has made such an impact and risen the, the floor of this team, especially with Mashburn dealing with injury, not really playing like himself. I'm curious your thoughts all together, and then you also are targeting a team to make the Sweet 16. Where are you looking for that? I like New Mexico. I'm going to talk about them a little bit mm -hmm. later in our show. Um, but in terms of my mid-major to go to the Sweet 16, there's two P's that I care about. There's path and there's personnel. So let's start with path. St. Mary's and Alabama, you know, hypothetically, if they're able to get past Charleston. Both of those teams are top five in a metric that you don't want to be a top five team in. And that's essentially playing down when you're playing quality opponents. So they've slipped in those moments and not played their best basketball. Right. And for that reason, I think that both St. Mary's and Alabama are susceptible to potentially getting picked off. Now let's talk personnel. March is about guards, and Grand Canyon has two great ones. Grant Foster and Ray Harrison in their backcourt. Not only are they scoring guards, they score 33 points per game as a duo, but they are attacking and they get to the line. They score nearly 20 points per game from the line, which is top five in the entire country. And I think that's the key for a St. Mary's team that's a little bit thin in terms of their front line. They've had some injury issues. They're obviously playing without Jefferson. Forbes, how effective is he going to be? Right. If Mitchell Saxon gets into foul trouble, I think this could be an early exit for the Gales. And for that reason, at nearly 5-1, to one, I want to hitch my wagon to the Antelopes, who for mo must, most of the season were right on the outside of the top 25. They, they were getting some votes there yep. when they were 17-1, and one, and they were really kind of 
grabbing the national attention, but still, they've flown under the radar because of their conference, the WAC. I think this is going to be a coming out party for Grant Foster. He started his career at Kansas, a high major talent. He had some health issues. He transferred around. He was at DePaul. He has found a home here, and I think if he gets a big highlight reel dunk as he is wont to do, very early in this game, the whole country is going to be like, who is this guy? And I think it's going to be a great moment for him to become a household name. Yeah, you don't have to tell me twice. I've been going on and on all week about how I like Grand Canyon in this opening round matchup. I think they, in general, can make a Sweet 16 run. Grant Foster, you mentioned cardiac arrest, suffered cardiac arrest in his first game at DePaul. 16-month recovery. Now he's at Grand Canyon. Leads them to their first win ever against a ranked opponent. Now they're in the big dance. Surely... With a coach like Bryce Drew, this team is built for success against a team like St. Mary's. So I like this pick as well. I'm going to give you guys my favorite future of this round. I'll round us out. And I'm going, I'm giving away one of my final four teams here. I'm taking North Carolina to win the West here at plus 340. I looked at this number, right? And I said, how is Arizona favored here? I think this is the fraudulent region. Every team has an issue. Alabama, I updated the last month numbers at Bar Torvik. They're 89th in terms of efficiency. Outside the top 200 defensively, they are, you could walk into the paint. I probably could score a bucket against this interior defense at this point. Baylor, you mentioned turnover issues. Could Loon Large rely a lot on elite shot making? We saw Miami be able to make a run through that elite shot making, but if they're not, those shots are not falling, they could run into an issue early on. And then Arizona, going through just the top four. This team does have slight defensive issues. They also have Caleb Love, who, as, as good as he can be, he also can completely shoot them out of games, and he's done that plenty of times. The, the game against Utah where they went to overtime, or double overtime, and, and nearly lost, like that was because he was just continually shooting, shooting them out of the game, or at least letting Utah creep in and stay in this game. I think that that's going to happen again if things go sideways. We saw in the opening round against Princeton last year, it was Creesa that shot them out of it. Well, if things are going wrong, I wouldn't be surprised if the same happens for Arizona. I know UNC has its issues covering the three-point line at times, but this is a top 10 defensive efficiency team for Ken Palm. They have the veterans. R.J. Davis, Armando Baycott have been in the championship game before. R.J. Davis is a superstar and the type of player you want to lead your team when you need a shot to be made. And then Harrison Ingram, I think the ultimate X factor in this. Just the five-star transfer from Stanford. This culminates in a veteran team that I think is going to make a run. You mentioned it with Arizona. I have them in my Final Four. They're probably the team that I was most hesitant about. But in this region, the, the thing that was interesting with what Oregon did was, and Caleb Love was unplayable against Oregon in the pack semifinal, they went a little bit of zone. They slowed him down. We've seen Arizona win these track meets, but we saw Princeton slow them down, and we've seen teams have success when you force them to play in the half court. Maybe even they see some zone that could slow them down uh, and force them to become jump shooters. Takes away their advantage inside, which they're going to have over everybody in this region. Yeah, the only well, yeah, the only thing is is with this Arizona team, I think Baylor does pose a semi threat. And, and Stuck, I'm curious your thoughts all together as well on this region and how this matches up. I know you're not so high on the Tar Heels, but do you think that Arizona is? Should be the rightful favorites of coming out of this. Yeah, the I, I don't know. I mean, how I don't know how Carolina's getting to the Final Four if they lose to Wagner on <laughs> Friday, but that's uh, or t tomorrow I should say. But uh, don't sleep on Wagner. I'm, I'm just kidding. But uh, uh, yeah, this is the region of chaos. So like, you can make a case for a lot of teams. I think Anthony brings up a really good point in regards to you know this is the time of the year. There's a lot of zone teams in in the field this year compared to last. Only one of the top. 38 most zone-heavy teams last year made it. I think there's like 15 to 16 of the top 38 made it this year. But this is the time of the year where you'll see wrinkles and teams that usually don't go zone will go zone and change up their defenses. Oregon is, uh, for what it's worth, a master of that under Dana Haltman. Who's, Haltman has been just unbelievable against the spread and uh, in these tourney formats. We just saw it in the Pac-12 tournament. But if zone sees a surprise zone uh, from somebody they could get tripped up. And if you look uh, during Pac-12 play, they went three and five, I believe, in games where they saw zone in more than 10 possessions. You can look back at the games against Washington State as one of the more zone-heavy teams in the field. That's, they swept them. Uh, USC used zone a ton when they beat them, and then they decided not to use it in the Pac-12 tournament for some reason. But that's an interesting wrinkle. I actually like Baylor to come out of this region speaking of zones which i think can be effective in a tournament setting they're going to get langston love back 
They have as much talent as anybody, you know, three future NBA players. They're, they're young. They've been getting better. They get to finally get out of, like, just the grind of the Big 12, and I think that's going to suit them well, you know, with playing potential teams like Arizona and North Carolina. So uh, I like I like Baylor to come out of here and make it to the Final Four. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. I think all of us have a different team coming out of this region, just playing into the region of chaos here. But that's going to we'll, we'll talk more about our futures uh, later on in the show in our Final Fours. But let's take a look at the most bet sides of the weekend. Get into our favorite sides bet wise, and Drake is the number one most bet team in terms of tickets. Flip as a underdog to a favorite, looking to wash away the sour taste after collapsing last year against Miami. Stucky's boys out of the OVC, Moorhead State, open as 13 and a half point underdogs. They're now down to 11 and a half, garnering 91% of the bets. And Nevada against Dayton, elevation trip for Dayton out to Salt Lake City against the Mountain West Curse, which may have been put aside last night with Colorado State's drubbing of Virginia. So I'm going to go first here. Speaking of the most bet teams, I'm just going to ride the public. I'm going to be Chucky public here. I'm going with the Drake Bulldogs here, minus one against Washington State. I think the key here, and we talked about this multiple times, guys, is that they can limit the second chance opportunities of Washington State. That's where the Cougars get their money is using their length and creating second chance points. Well, Drake, they're one of the best teams in the country at limiting those. And when you just look at just overall performance over the last month, Drake over or Jake has performed way better than Washington State. They also have more shot makers and elite shot makers at that with Tucker DeVries. And so I expect in March, just a team like Drake to really find success against a team that doesn't really have the offensive capabilities or ceiling that Washington State does. And just a cool little, little trend here. Uh, since 2005, when a team is ranked two spots higher and also the underdog in the matchup 22 31 and one against the spread that's from evan abrams also another one when teams that shoot 75 plus percent from the free throw line against teams that shoot less than that 69 45 and two against the spread 61 percent so i really like the drake bulldogs here coming out of this 7 10 matchup Devondo, i'll kick it to you your favorite one you're targeting jmu a 31 win team against a Wisconsin team that may have put aside their losing ways with a little run in the Big Ten champion to the Big Ten championship. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't that long ago that this Wisconsin team was a top 10 consensus team and people yep. were talking three seed, compete with Purdue. They really fell off in the second half, and it was ultimately their defense that caused a lot of problems for them. They don't guard the perimeter very well in the Big Ten, and now they're going up, you know, and leaving the conference play. The conference generally, when you look at recent tournament history, there has been struggles, and the biggest issue they've had has been guarding the perimeter when they face these more dynamic guards, and I do think JMU has the guards to get after them. There's two areas where I think JMU kind of has advantages here. Turnover differential, JMU has the advantage. Three-point differential and variance-wise, I think that favors the dog as well. So I like JMU catching five and a half here and sprinkled some money line two to one. Took them yesterday on our Cinderella draft. They're my favorite 12 seed upset in this first round. Wisconsin, since February 1st, all the way down at 38th in Bartorvik efficiency. And what you've seen since then has been not just the three point defensive problems, but the rim defense right. has not been great. So I think JMU scores enough to stay in this game, keeps it close. Wisconsin, Again, with their concerns, if the threes aren't falling, which we just saw, they ran red hot in, in Minnesota last week. If they're not falling, though, they're playing more like a 40th-ish best team. JMU closer to about 60. I think this is uh, you know just a couple point difference. Yeah, prior to the conference tournament, 8 of 11 they lost. And then they have this little run. They're playing JMU. If there's one thing the Dukes know how to do, it's win. Are you on board with an underdog here? Yeah, I'm on JMU as well, and I think what's nice is that they have two star players. You look at what Furman did to Virginia in their upset last year. It's nice to have a guy on the low block and players on the perimeter that can make things happen because it makes it much more difficult to game plan against them. Not that Wisconsin could game plan against anybody because defensively they're giving up good shots, good looks, and you know the basketball is going in left and right. They're in the 270s in two-point percentage defense. That's just unheard of for a Big Ten team that you should you'd be used to playing those half-court, grinded-out kind of games. So I think JMU is going to push the pace. They're going to get good looks for all 40 minutes. And I think there's a chance that they win this one going away. Uh, I'm very interested to see how this one goes. I'm a bit more nervous myself, just given how Wisconsin played of late. But it does make sense, right? That's I'm doing that. Probably the public is thinking, well, Wisconsin, they just started figuring it out. And they were one of the top expected teams in the country. But speaking of a top team in the country, Creighton has been top five since mid-February, since they started this like end of season playing extremely well. Stucky, you're looking to fade them against the spread here against the Mac champs of Akron. 
yeah, I really like Akron here catching the points. This is kind of an under the radar upset that I haven't seen many people pick if you're looking to get a little crazy in your bracket. But uh, I think that Akron will slow this game down to a halt. They're not as slow as they were two years ago when they almost upset UCLA. Uh, and in that game, it ended 57-53. Uh, many of the starters from that team are backs. This is a super experienced team with tournament experience. John Gross, by the way, 7-1 and one against the spread in the NCAA tournament. So he's been really good in this spot. In this particular type of spot, MAC teams have also been very good historically. But I think Akron, very good perimeter defense. They'll slow this game down. And by the way, Creighton, not a super fast team. So I think this game will be played in the half court, lo lower possession game, which does favor the underdog. And you need to be able to beat Creighton in the mid-range. And Akron has a number of guys to do that. A very efficient team in the mid-range. They also have a big who can shoot threes. So he could pull Kalkbrenner out and cause some matchup issues. Obviously, if Creighton is making their threes, but they shoot at a top 10 frequency, the, yeah, Akron might struggle to keep up. But Akron, 99th percentile per synergy in jump shot defense. And Akron has shooters, and they've been running really cold, which explains kind of their swoon at the end of the regular season. Their three-point percentage dropped off by about 6% after February 1st. So don't be surprised if guys like Tribble get white hot in this game. Uh, I think Akron will make this interesting. I like the 12 and a half. Yeah. What, what, a, what a way they get into the tournament, right? They, they, they're they down one. They get intentionally fouled in the final five seconds, not knowing the score. Now they're in the NCAA tournament. They're drawing a Creighton team. If they make this upset, this is a Cinderella story run for the ages. I mean, the Jays, we have, they have so many shot makers. We love them. There are flaws, right? They play a style yeah. that, like, if the, job, the jump shots aren't going in, then they don't turn anybody over. They don't rebound, so... They're a, a team of all the 13 through 16. I think they're the most live to pull an upset. They also are one of the, at least in my opinion, one of the ones that can make a very deep run as a three seed. But I'll kick it to you, Talabrese. You're also targeting an underdog in this matchup, or in, not in this matchup, but in the NCAA tournament round of 64. You're heading to Bucky Ball to take down, or potentially take down, the Jayhawks. So Stucky was pointing out, you know, an underdog that plays slow, limits possessions. I'll go in the opposite direction. Bucky Ball is going to just go for 40 minutes of hell in this game. They're going to go with a lot of pressure defense. They force 16 turnovers per game. That's top 10 nationally. In terms of tempo, they're 14th. And it's like a hockey line change. They just bring in fresh bodies and just try to run people off the floor. They have so many players that they put in their rotation. They actually have 10 players who play 12 minutes or more per game. And of their rotation, they have eight shooters who shoot 38 percent or better from three-point range so if they get hot if they make double digit threes in this game and then force a kansas team to knock down shots i think that's going to be problematic because kansas for you know their ups and downs this season they've never been world beaters from long range they're 33.3 percent from three-point range that's 210th in right. the country and now no mcculler Furphy's going to have to have just a breakout game, and if he doesn't, I think Kansas is really up against it in this particular game. The final piece of it, as we mentioned, the altitude, I think with a short bench, that is the perfect recipe for Sanford. When it, you know, the draw first came out, you could make some arguments that Kansas wasn't the kind of team that you wanted to play because they're so good in transition. But with this thin bench and the altitude, I think this is actually trending towards the underdog. Yeah, it's going to be interesting here. As you mentioned, leading scorer Kevin McCuller out, and I was looking into it. Dickinson, obviously his production declines as well when McCullough is out. It's such an interesting game, and, and as I mentioned to you, I was like, oh man, like how deep is Sanford? Because looking deep into it, if you're going to press the whole time, you're going to zone. It's going to be interesting because Kansas does have a couple of guys that can kill the zone, like K.J. Adams working with Hunter Dickinson. How healthy Dickinson is, also a question that should be answered you know, pretty quickly into this game. So there you have it. Stuck, uh, Stucky is on Akron, plus 12.5. Calabrese on Sanford plus seven and a half Bucky ball. JMU, the 31 win Dukes. DeBundo has them on plus five and a half. And I'm riding with the public on Drake here against Washington State. You heard our favorite sides. Well, let's take a look at some of the most bet totals of the NCAA tournament. And the most bet under is Nevada against Dayton. Dayton heading to elevation against a Nevada team that surprisingly fell to a 10 seed, kind of an underseeded one. Definitely an interesting matchup to look for. And then Marquette against Western Kentucky. How healthy is Tyler Kohler going to be? We will know until that game. And then 
JMU, Wisconsin, the over, getting a ton of love, nearly 80% of bets. We talked about the three-point variance that could come down there. So I'll kick it to you, Devondo, first. Uh, your favorite total of the weekend. You're actually going to a game that we haven't discussed at all most of this week. Yeah, I think it was the first game, maybe on the Sunday reaction right. show, where I said, hey, look, like Auburn, Yale. It's like Yale's got an interesting profile. The more I've looked into it, the, the more I struggle to see Yale getting a ton of offense in this game. But I think the only way for Yale to stay in this is if this game is under 141, and I do think at 141 it's a touch high. So Yale is elite at preventing turnovers, which is important against Auburn because Auburn, if they can turn you over, they showed it kind of on Sunday against Florida, when they're able to get transition offense, it's just layup, layup, layup. Very easy yep. for them to explode and go on these huge runs and, and kind of turn games. But Yale is going to play slow, and they're going to force this game into the half court and prevent Auburn from running in transition. Kind of similar, if there were to be an upset, to what Princeton did to Arizona last year. And on the other side of it, Auburn dominates with the rebounding advantages, but they're not going to get that against these Ivy League teams, which, you know, you think, in theory, oh, Ivy doesn't have the athletes to stick with, you know, the SEC guys, but... They, these Ivy teams always rebound well. Of course, there was the famous Baylor-Yale game where Yale out-rebounded Baylor. I think it's kind of similar to this where this Yale team, elite defensively on the glass, is going to prevent second chance looks, which will just make this game play much slower than the projections are expecting. So as a result of that, I think even if Auburn wins, Yale struggles to score in the half court, this game is going to be played at a pace that Yale wants, not necessarily the one Auburn wants. So I like under 141. And when you look at the home away splits, you don't have to dig all that deep to see that Auburn has issues in their backcourt. You know, when they're at home and they get momentum and their guards start feeling good about themselves, particularly their younger players, all of a sudden they're blowing teams out. But on the road, if they open up, you know, they miss their first three or four triples, I think it's going to be a very familiar script, and I think the under is a sharp play there. And that's where you see the turnover rate spike and you see the three-point attempt rate spike. And, and we talked about this. If Yale's going to pull it off, it's going to be because they take bad shots from three. Yale will let them shoot three, so it is a high-variance approach that gives them a chance to win. But again, like even when Princeton won last year, it wasn't because their offense was any good. It was because Dubellas kept turning the ball over, Carissa kept missing threes. That's a, a scenario where you know this game is played in, this, in the 60s and, and it stays under. Yeah, and, that, and if you want to know, to learn more about how to rebound a ball, just ask Torian Prince. Uh, that's considered a rebound, grabbing a miss there. Uh, so Calabrese, you are doing the opposite, just like last time. DeBundo's talking about a game being slowed down. You think a team is just gonna run, run, run the score up. Yeah, so I look at a team total here, Arizona over 92 and a half points, and the Cats are second nationally in fast break points, and Long Beach wants to play fast, so they don't even have to coax them into a game like this. It's going to be a track meet from the get-go. Now, altitude was a concern, but then when you look at their numbers this year, they go to Utah, they score over 100 points in a triple overtime game. You figure, oh, they have dead legs going to Colorado two days later. They scored 99 points in yeah. that game. And what I think is interesting, as the eighth-rated offense in the country, they have motivation to make up for last year, to not take a 15 seed lightly. And I think for that reason, you're going to see them come out with their hair on fire. They've surpassed this number 92 and a half on 12 occasions this year. And what's nice is the sample size, in a lot of cases, they were playing down. They are playing Morgan State and Southern and Belmont and UT Arlington and they did not take their foot off the accelerator. Yeah. So uh, you don't have to look too deep in terms of their film to see an exact comp and example of this. And for that reason, I think motivation and the game flow that is predicted in this game, Arizona is just going to play up and down for 40 minutes. So just a quick question. So obviously, you know, not like Princeton, where Princeton slowed them down. Long mm -hmm. Beach State is going to want to speed them up. And you don't have to tell Arizona to shoot the ball within 10 seconds of your shot clock. Are you, are you worried at all, though, given you know the talent discrepancy that's there between the 15 and 2, that maybe they rest some of their players, unlike in the non-con, where maybe it's worth racking up the points, racking up the deficit, and then having a better net ranking altogether, looking at the team total rather than like a first-half team total? Yeah, I think a first-half team total is also a short play, but we could be looking at 60 points in the first half. Like That's how aggressive they are going to be and how non-existent this transition defense is for Long Beach. So with those things in mind, I think the Wildcats are a safe play to go for 100 here. Beach likes to press, too, which, you know, I don't know if that's going to work, but it's worth a shot, maybe, but it also could lead to a lot of dunks. Yeah, and they're going to have more than equipped with uh, plenty of athletes in that backcourt. Yeah. yeah, and also their bench is probably, you know, up the par with the Long Beach State starters. But, Stuck, you're looking at a first half under instead. You're heading out to Houston Longwood, uh, one versus 16. I'm not sure how Longwood, you know, even stays in this game. Houston could win this by 50 if they so choose. Yeah, historically, Houston has just absolutely demolished these significantly inferior teams. But I just, I really don't know how Longwood scores in this game. 
they're kind of like a Houston light in their league, and they're just going up against a astronomically better version of them. Like they want to get into the paint, they want to live on the offensive glass. Uh, you know, it's not a great matchup for that offense. So I, I, it's hard for me to see them scoring efficiently at all. Houston obviously plays really slow. Houston will also take just some bad shots, and there's going to be some possessions and maybe even some mini droughts during the first half. So, yeah, I think this sets up as lower scoring first half and probably game overall. And for what it's worth, in matchups of two teams that average fewer than 70 possessions, which we have here, the first half under in the NCAA tournament has gone 149, 111, and 5 over the past 20 years. It's just under 58%. The reason I prefer the first half under rather than the full game under is Houston has to worry about like their depth, they're, they've been dealing with some injuries. So they built a big lead here. They might pull guys a little sooner than you normally would see. That's why I want no part of the spread either. So in the game, just could get weird in the second half in the end. So uh, I think Houston's defense comes out fully focused here after they got crushed by Iowa State. They put the clamps on Longwood. And, uh, you know, this is, will probably be like, I wouldn't be surprised if this is like, uh, you know, 37, 50. 18 at the half yeah it's 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 super interesting and when this line dropped on open just the spread it was 19 19 and a half quickly up five six points because i don't know how longwood is going to score here against houston and i think houston can roll and, and name their number quite frankly and, and what's interesting too there's certain things that you can game plan and you can try to you know go against a zone in the half court in practice you cannot replicate the on-ball pressure from right. shed like what he does is so special and I think sometimes we give all the flowers to the offensive players. They can take you off the dribble. They can shoot from the logo. He can pick you up as soon as you get off the bus. And I think for that reason, you're going to see so many turnovers and just them, you know, being in deep water early against a Houston team that's motivated. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see if they can even put up 40 points. But look like look like Virginia out there from yesterday. But I'm also looking toward a first half under in this uh, round of 64. I'm looking at Duquesne, BYU. Duquesne, we saw it. The confetti fell, and then they went on a seven-minute drought offensively. This team is horrific on the offensive, and I'm not sure how they're going to really score here against BYU. They're outside the top 200 also in first half points per game, so it's not like they're an offense that starts out hot. They start out slow. The game's early. Since 2011, games that start out before 1 p.m. Eastern time, 62% clip to the under. BYU, they love to shoot threes. That's their calling card. Obviously, this could... You know, they could make 10 threes and all of a sudden it's a dead number, but they are 350th away from home per Haslam metrics. Duquesne, the one thing that they are good at is defense. They are good at defending the perimeter. They rarely give up 10 plus threes a game. I believe it's only once or twice this entire season. So when I look at this game, BYU leaving the elevation, coming out, how well will they perform in this first half? Could see some tiredness just out of the early start. Could see some elevation issues just moving out of there. So I'm looking at the first half under 66 and a half in this game. So to, to, for more just like looking at this game and, and all that, you can track sharp action, where, see where the money is percentage. I mentioned the most bet tickets and unders all together. And you can get that through the Action Pro. If you've ever wanted to try the best version of the Action app, that time is now because we're running a special offer on Action Pro. To celebrate the start of the NCAA tournament, you can try Pro Access for just $9.99 for the first month. With Action Pro, you get our biggest betting model edges, real-time money percentages, data-driven systems, NCAA tournament player prop projections from the predictive analytics team of Sean Kerner and Nick Giffen and lots more. Just visit actionnetwork.com slash madness to take advantage before this deal expires. That's actionnetwork.com slash madness. And, you know, I mentioned Sean Kerner, Nick Giffen. It's not quite, you know, Beetlejuice saying your names three times and you appear, <laughs> but I do say your names and here you both are. Player prop time. You guys are going to give us your round of 64 player favorite props. Then we'll get your final four in championship at the very end. Sean, I'll kick it to you first. Where are you headed in this round of 64 games? Yeah, so for my first prop, I'm going to this Mississippi State-Michigan State game. Uh, and I'm going with Tyson Walker of Michigan State to go under three and a half assists. You can get it at even money, which makes it even better. But, uh, you know, Walker stayed under this number 59% of the time uh, in conference play. And that was with Michigan State averaging 70 points a game. Uh, their team total for this matchup is just 65 and a half, which, you know, is going to ding his assist projection a tad. 
Uh, Mississippi State, you know, they play at a slower pace, um, and they allow an assist on 2% fewer field goals made than your league average team. Um, and their defense, you know, that ranks top 20 in Ken Palm's efficiency metric, uh, and they allow their opponents to shoot just 29% from beyond the arc, which is the fourth lowest rate in the country, which is going to make it, you know, that much more difficult for Walker to rack up assists. Uh, so we're projecting him closer to three assists here with about a 63% chance he stays under three and a half assists. Yeah, it's interesting. You mentioned, you know, the low three-point volume. Also, 10% of those threes come off the dribble, which takes away that assist attraction. They also like to funnel people into the mid-range. That's a plus for Tyson Walker, who doesn't really have a knack for t attacking the rim or trying to dish it out. He loves the mid-range jumper. I want to ask you, though, Sean, uh, you know, this is the NCAA tournament. Obviously, yeah. you want to back some of the superstar scores in the points department. Tyson Walker is the guy who can completely take over a game. I'm curious your thoughts when you're breaking down this. Does that factor into it at all that maybe, you know, Mississippi State, they want you to attack in isolation. They want you to have a primary score like Walker where maybe he's not going to look to pass as much. Yeah, I think that's probably just a bonus point on why I like the under even more. Uh, we're not necessarily factoring that in, but the fact that we already show value on the under here and just mentally thinking that, yeah, he'll probably take more shots, which will, you know, take away from his potential assist rate. Um, that's just, again, another factor that I think goes in the favor of him staying under three and a half assists. Right. He takes over 30% of the shots as is. Seems like, you know, in a tight game, he's not giving that ball up at all. But <laughs> Nick, I'll go to you next. It's South Carolina, Oregon, you're keying on here. It's an interesting matchup. Oregon, the Pac-12 champs. South Carolina surprised everybody. Picked at the bottom of the SEC. Now they're in the tournament. What's your favorite prop in this matchup? Yeah, no, this is definitely a coin flip game. But as far as player props, uh, I'm going to go over to South Carolina's Colin Murray Boyles to have over one and a half assists at minus 135. And I mean, look, the Oregon Ducks, they can't stop shooters. Uh, they're 246 in effective field goal percent defense. So what that means is South Carolina is going to be making shots. So if they're making shots. There's always the potential for those to be assisted. And the other things that could potentially hurt assists would be something like uh, an assist rate. Well, Oregon allows right around the league average assist rate, and they've been actually allowing a higher assist rate recently. Also, Oregon's pace is about neutral. Their turnovers forced is about neutral in terms of rate, uh, and their foul rate is about neutral. So it's not like they're hurting South Carolina by creating more turnovers or putting South Carolina on the free throw line where you can't get an assist, that kind of stuff. So uh, this projection for Colin Murray Boyles is pretty fair. It, and a lot of it comes from the fact that Oregon just does not stop shooters. And also one thing I want to point out, Colin Murray Boyles uh, in the last 16 games where South Carolina has had their current like starting rotation and their current active rotation, uh, he has gone over this number in 10 of those 16 games, plus his minutes have been increasing. Uh, and then you know, against top 100 competition, he actually, Colin Murray Boyles, becomes less of a shooter and more of an assister. He actually, his shooting rate goes down against top 100 competition. His assist rate goes up against top 100 competition. So uh, I'm not even factoring in that assist rate increase or that shot rate decrease against top 100 competition. I'm still getting, you know, we're, Sean and I are getting around 2.3 assists with a 67% chance of going over one and a half. So that would be like minus 200 at fair odds. So totally fine with minus 135. And like I said, there's a couple bonus points where um, the, the against top 100 competition and Oregon allowing a higher assist rate recently that aren't even factored into this projection. Yeah, Murray Boyles obviously battled mono early on in the season. That cut into his workload as he got into a groove. We've kind of seen him of late absolutely dominate all over the floor, become a huge big man in South Carolina's success. And also Oregon, I mean, I, I was watching the Pac-12 championship. Rahad Colorado Future was really hoping for it. But the one thing that Dana Altman does so well is – he throws zone looks at the other teams, and that leads to more assist chances, which is why I also love this prop that, you know, you put out. I saw it, and my eyes kind of glue up. I was like, oh, <laughs> wow, like all the zone that comes out, plus Arizona and Colorado, almost 80% of all their field goals were assisted on. So that's just another bonus that, you know, obviously you don't have yeah. fully factored into that. So, But, Sean, I'll kick it back to you. I'm, I'm playing assist man here. I'm going to throw you the pass here now. Your turn uh, for your second prop of the first week. Yeah, so for my second prop, um, I'm going to this Texas-Colorado State matchup, and I'm going with uh, Patrick Cartier of Colorado State. 
to go under three and a half rebounds at minus 110. And, you know, Cartier is a pretty low rebound, has a pretty low rebound rate for a power forward slash center uh, and typically tops out around 24 minutes. So I just don't think he has much upside in this market. Um, Colorado State has faced a top 50 team like Texas 13 times this year. And Cartier has stayed under this in nine of those games. So that's a nice 69% rate right there. Um, and Texas is a, you know, really good shooting team. They rely on two point attempts more than your average team. So that's likely going to result in fewer rebound attempts potentially for Cartier here. So uh, again, this isn't a number he typically clears and this is a tough spot for him. So we're projecting him closer to three boards here with about a 63% chance. He stays under three and a half rebounds. Yeah. Colorado state doesn't attack the offensive glass or outside the top 300 and second chance opportunities. And it also feels like watching that Virginia game uh, yesterday, both Clifford, both Scott were the guys that were kind of attacking the glass and Cartier is kind of okay with sitting around the perimeter. Okay. With kind of just playing in that mid range, not really grabbing those rebounds. So I love this look as well as Colorado state gears up for their second game in three days. All right, Nick, round us off, take us home. Your last prop of the round of 64. Yeah, well, Charlie, Charlie's already racked up over half an assist, but then he had to throw <laughs> that Virginia jab in there, which uh, oh, stings for me. But that's all right. We'll move on. So I'm going to go to uh, the Cam Kansas versus Samford game, and I'm going to take Dewan Harris to have over half a three-point made at plus 120. And I'm surprised this line didn't move too much after the news was announced that there will be no Kevin McCullough playing in this tournament for Kansas. Dewan Harris's shot percentage jumps from around 14 and a half percent of possessions played uh, where he takes a shot on it to over 20 percent of the possessions he plays where he takes a shot in games where McCullough is out. And I'm not even including that in the projection because, you know, it's only a five or a six game sample size, five games uh, with Hunter Dickinson. And then there's a game where Hunter Dickinson also didn't play. I, I'm, I'm assuming Hunter Dickinson's going to play. So I'd rather use that five game sample size. So I'm not baking in a lot of, uh, you know, shot percentage increase here for Harrison already showing value on the over and Sanford is a pretty comfortable comfortable matchup they allow over 40 percent of field goal attempts to come from outside the arc compared to around a little over 37 percent national average they also don't have a great three-point shooting defense allowing around 34 percent versus 33.8 percent national average and they also play at the 14th fastest adjusted pace in the nation. So certainly some more possessions to go around here, which means just a few extra opportunities for Harris to potentially take a three-point attempt. So I'm actually projecting Harris around one three-point made with a 58% chance to have at least one. And that's before making any, like I said, any adjustments to his shot percentage, which does tend to go up without Kevin McCuller here. And I haven't been able to find any ladder uh, three point, uh, made for him, but I would like two plus, you know, something like that, uh, at certain price points based off what I'm seeing on over half. Uh, so if any of those pop up, keep an eye out on those as well. Yeah. I saw this at plus money and I was like, Oh, all right, this looks pretty good. You know, McCuller takes the most amount of threes for Kansas. Now he's out Johnny Furphy, the next up, but after him, it yep. doesn't feel like there's many options for Kansas. Harris will have the ball in his hands for the majority of the game. And it almost feels like sometimes teams dare him to shoot the three. And he's more than capable of hitting that long range jumper. And Nick, listen, I don't want to throw another shot at you. I might have to put my hands up, but hopefully he's able to make some threes. Unlike that Virginia offense from yesterday. Oh yeah. That was, that was abysmal. <laughs> I mean, nearly an hour of real time without a point scored. I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. I know Stucky mentioned off the show that he was like, I got an hour nap in. And I was like, yeah, you probably woke up and they only <laughs> scored two or three points in that span. But all right, guys, before we get out of here, we got your props, but we want to hear your final fours and, of course, your champion. I know you guys have, you know, your articles out in the Action Network, but tell the fans at home, Sean, I'll start with you, your final four, and then your, who's cutting down the nets at the end. Yeah, so my final four is Auburn, Arizona, Houston, Tennessee, and I have Houston beating Arizona in the finals. All right, and Nick? Yeah, well, I promised Sean and I didn't share our final fours. Uh, last year, we ended up on the exact same <laughs> final four. This year, three of the four are the same. I have number one, Houston, number one, Purdue, instead of he has Tennessee, number two, Arizona, and number four, Auburn. But I have Arizona cutting down the nets over Purdue. Wow. All right. You know, these are not, you know, as you guys are the predictive analytics team and me just trying to pick my bracket together, only having two of the four final fours doesn't make me feel, you know, the greatest, but I do have Houston and I do have Auburn. So at least 
you know, the Yukon fade. We can all hold hands into the sunset together with that one. But Nick <laughs> Giffen, Sean Kerner, thank you so much, guys. Appreciate you hopping on and enjoy the madness. Anytime. And just a reminder that Road to the Final Scores Tournament Preview Show is presented by Bet365. Bet365 doesn't do ordinary. That's why you get more boosts with them than with anyone else. Bet365 boosts specific markets, your winnings, and even parlays. And they don't stop there. College basketball showpiece competition takes place this month. And if you can correctly predict the outcome of every game at Bet365, you will scoop a top prize of $10 million. There's also a cool 100,000 up for grabs for the player who scores the most points throughout NCAA tournament as well. Make sure you join Bet365 and play your bracket for free before the opening round one game tips off. It's never ordinary at Bet365. 21 plus only or 18 plus in Kentucky and present in Arizona, Colorado, Indiana, Iowa, Kentucky, Louisiana, New Jersey, North Carolina, Ohio, Virginia. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa. Terms and conditions and restrictions apply. And let's hear from Dan O'Mataya for his favorite bet of the round of 64 in the women's tournament, as well as his final four and eventual national champion. Dan O'Mataya here to break down and preview the women's tournament for March Madness, and it's going to be a doozy. Uh, I'm going to give you my best bet of the opening weekend, my final four picks, and my national championship pick. Uh, best bet of the opening weekend, I am going with the Lady Rebels of Old Miss, laying minus six against Marquette. Uh, I think it's minus six and a half in some places. I play it up to ten. Uh, Ole Miss has been so hot, covering in seven straight games, and meanwhile Marquette uh, didn't score in the fourth quarter against UConn. Total zero points, and Aliyah Edwards wasn't even playing uh, for the UConn Huskies. So, um, love Ole Miss. I think they're gonna route Marquette. Next, I want to get to my final four picks. Uh, this is what I think will happen, not where I technically see value, but I think we're gonna start with South Carolina. I think they get it done. I don't know if they're tested uh, completely in this region, but uh, you never know. Oregon State could give them a run for their money, but still taking South Carolina there uh, in Albany too, the region of death. I am going to pick Iowa. I I think they get it done. I don't think the value is there, uh, but I think Caitlin Clark is going to get a massive amount of calls in her tournament run, and I think she gets it done somehow. Uh, the world is better with Caitlin Clark and Iowa playing. The TV ratings go nuts. Uh, it's what we all need. Next, I am going to go to the Portland 3 region. That is USC's region. Um, I don't like USC to come out of it as a one seed. I, I basically lean either Duke UConn or Ohio State and uh, for this I'm taking uh, taking UConn. I got Nika Mule back there watching over me. I think she's going to get it done. And finally with Portland 4, homer pick for sure, but I am taking the Texas Longhorns. Uh, I think Vic Schaefer and the Horns have found something incredible in Madison Booker. The female Kevin Durant, number 35, she is a stud, only a freshman, uh, going to continue to get better. And I think Texas just has too much defense, too much strength, too much speed, too much size. Uh, yeah, so from there in the national championship, uh, I think we get the rematch of last year's Final Four. I think we get Iowa. And I think we get South Carolina. I think it's the most watched game of all time. Uh, could be a storybook ending if Kaitlyn Clark can go out as a champion. Um, and I'll probably hedge because I have South Carolina at 13 to 1 to win it all. But uh, in my heart of hearts, I do think South Carolina is head and shoulders above everyone still. I still think they're the best team in the country, and I think they take it home and win it all. Thank you, Dano. You heard his thoughts on the Final Four and champion on the women's side. We heard Nick Giffen, Sean Kerner give out their Final Four and champion as well. So it's only fitting that we end with ours. I'll start. I talked about UNC earlier. I expect them to come out of their region. My rest of my final four, the four seed, Auburn. I have them taking down UConn in the Sweet 16, coming out of that bracket region. Creighton in the bottom right. I have them beating Tennessee as well as Purdue. And then to round it all out, this was the hardest decision for me, but I did align with Stuckey and the Houston Cougars, my championship. I have the Tar Heels cutting down the nets over the Houston Cougars. I just think RJ Davis... Armando Baycott, their experience looms large. And Harrison Ingram, his presence alone has just risen the ceiling of this UNC team. If Cormac Ryan gets hot from three, 
this is one of my favorite teams to watch in March. So I'm going to take the Tar Heels over Houston, and that's my final four. Calabrese, what about you? So the average seed total when you add up the teams that make the final four is 12.3. Although on three occasions it's been 20 or higher as it was last year, seeing you know San Diego State get in as a five, FAU as a nine. So after watching this entire season, top 10 teams are dropping left and right. I just It didn't sit right with me to not have one Cinderella to make it all the way to the Final Four. So I'm going to start with New Mexico, who has already been a very consistent team. They are close to top 40 in both offensive and defensive efficiency, yep. according to Ken Palm. And finally, getting Dent back healthy after dealing with the flu. Having him in the mix, they have the guard play to make a deep run. So I'm going to go with them, UConn, Purdue, and Kentucky. And the thing about UConn is that I just trust them in a head-to-head -head matchup. You have Auburn. I think it's going to come down to guard play because a lot of the strengths on both yeah. sides, they're going to cancel each other out. I don't think that either team is going to live on the offensive glass as they have against other opponents this season. So it just comes down to can Cam Spencer make more shots than the Auburn backcourt? I believe that he can. And this has been a weird year where flawed teams have won. They've put on runs. You've seen teams like Purdue get boat raced by a team like Nebraska. Yep. You saw UConn lose to Seton Hall going away. Kentucky's a flawed team, but I know that they can rev up the engine offensively and they have something special that they can bring to the table. And I just can't quite get it out of my mind, that Houston game against Baylor where they were so dominant in the first half and people were you know, tweeting that it was a coronation for them. This is one of the best teams of the last 10 years. And then they went in a deep freeze, and that game actually goes to overtime. Baylor should have won on the foul line at the end of regulation. I think if Kentucky can up the pace, have it be a higher scoring game in the 70s, 80s against Houston outside of their comfort zone, I think they'll be able to sneak by. So a few a few risks in in this, but I'm going to have UConn over Purdue in the national title. So do the two one seeds as well. My, the other two one seeds that I chose, you're going the opposite with your championship. I do think it's interesting. The sky is the limit for Kentucky, right? Like they can win the national championship. They have the offensive firepower too. Just that defensive like lapse gives me issues and, and I don't know I could easily see them going down right away I could also see him making a deep run and just going back to your UConn Auburn point just the one thing that I think has the huge advantage for the Tigers is Janai Broom and I think his ability to stretch the floor kind of pick apart Donovan Klingon if need be we saw Klingon deal with foul trouble at times throughout the year against better bigs I think that this could happen again here and obviously I am worried about the guard play but they run right Auburn can easily take down UConn here I think it's going to be a an incredible Sweet 16 matchup. Hopefully, we get that four versus one. As DeBundo is pointing out, it's going to be in the TD Garden up in Boston, so it's going to be stores north in that situation. A lot of Husky fans putting the pressure. They always on travel well, though, regardless. Even Madison Square Garden, it's Huskies always. Uh, Stucky, your Final Four, and then your championship matchup. Yeah. Uh, well, just to let you know, I I have figured out how to time travel. Now you might say, why don't I just fill out the perfect bracket and win the bet three six five? I don't want to blow my cover. No one's going to believe me <laughs> saying this. But, so, uh, getting the final four right is not going to really blow my cover. It's not going to raise any red flags. So, I'll give you the actual final four from my time traveling time. Uh, it <laughs> is Houston. Oh, I've said all year. It's going to come out of that region. Uh, UConn. I wanted to knock off UConn. Uh, it's before the bracket came out. I said, I'm knocking off UConn with the four seed. I just don't trust Auburn enough. I know that's going to be a sharp pick to get to the Final Four. Uh, I, I don't hate it, but uh, I went with UConn there. And then um, there were my two one seeds. And then I'm going with Baylor. Talked about them earlier. And Tennessee. And I think this is actually a year we have two dominant teams that get to the championship. And that's Houston and UConn. And so I'm going chalk. I'm going with the chalky Final Four. Usually don't. And I'm going Houston as the national champ. A lot of one seeds throughout for all of us. Actually, a one seed for all three of us so far. DeBundo, are you going to make it a clean sweep with having one seeds in the championship? What about your final four as well? Well, Stucky let me time travel with him. So I actually... Now, uh, are you Doc Brown or are you Marty McFly in this situation? I was actually wearing a vest the other day, so I'm going to go with Marty McFly. Uh, Houston... Bundo has, I heard, by the way, we had to make DeBundo change his final four because originally he had six Mountain West teams in the final <laughs> four when we had a film that's not mathematically possible. Uh, can we get four? Yeah, I have Nevada, I have New Mexico, uh, <laughs> Colorado, Colorado State, State <laughs> and uh, did we not have one up there in, the, in that region? Boise. If Boise survives tonight, they might make a run. Uh, no, and also, Mountain West Final Four. <laughs> exactly. They're going to actually play the, the championship uh, in Fort Collins as well. So uh, My Final Four, though, Houston and UConn have been the two best teams all year. I agree with Stucky. Last year, the conversation, every week, it felt like you guys said it on Big Bets on Campus. 
there are no dominant team. There's no clear number one team. UConn won it as a four seed. We had a two fives and a nine. This year, yes, there have been upsets. The, the back half of the top ten has gotten picked off on the road a bunch. But the top three have been the top three all year. And it's Houston, UConn, and Purdue pretty much had the one seeds locked up by February. And we kind of knew going in, you look at the efficiency metrics, the top three one seeds, third strongest they've been ever since 2002. So I really do think Houston, UConn are kind of a class above. And look, I think Auburn is interesting too, but I don't know that Auburn gets past Yale or San Diego State because those are two difficult teams that have had you know tournament success in the past. I think Michigan State is going to knock off UNC, so I think that opens up the region of chaos uh, in the West. I'm going to go with Arizona, even though I generally... Like, it makes my skin crawl to pick Arizona, but I really don't trust anybody else. It's like Charlie was saying earlier, Baylor, Alabama, not, not loving those teams. So I'm going to go with Zona in my Final Four, Houston, and I didn't want to pick three in one seeds, and I was between Purdue, Creighton, and Tennessee. Ultimately, I'm a little concerned about Creighton's reliance on shot making, so I'm going with Tennessee to get to the Elite Eight, Tennessee to make the Final Four. Uh, I know I said last year Purdue was going to make the Final Four. I can't do it again. I'm too scarred from last season. So Tennessee, Houston, UConn, Zona. Houston beats UConn for the national title. They're my preseason pick as well. So give me the Cougs. Last year. Do and Matt Payne a redemption tour? You tweeted all year, all summer about it. <laughs> yeah. I, I just quite, can't quite see it with this team. Listen, last year, Anthony learned from his mistakes. He tried to go out on his own opinion here and say Purdue was going to make a run. Then he decided to pull his best middle school impression and copy Stuck's exact Final Four <laughs> to slightly tweak it a little bit, have the same winners. But there you have he it. He gave me, I went with him time traveling. I, I have yeah, the answer. Yeah, he was. He's in your backpack or something like that. But thank you all for tuning in to the Road to the Final Score tournament preview show. Thanks to Stucky, Calabrese, and DeBundo alongside Nick Giffen and Sean Kerner and Dano Mattia on the women's side. We're going to be back on Big Bets on Campus every single day at 10.30 a.m. Eastern time. So you'll check us out there. Make sure to check us out in the Action app. And if you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. It really helps a lot. And of course, we're not going to let you go with just our final four picks and championship preview. We're going to get a word from the rest of the Action Network team. Hey, everyone. Colin Wilson. Here's my final four. I'm going to go Iowa State over number one seeded North Carolina. I'm going to go Houston number one seeded over Tennessee. And yes, the Big 12 champions, Iowa State, defeating Houston in the national championship. My final four picks are Houston, Creighton, Baylor, and Auburn. And my champion is Houston because they're a bunch of bloodthirsty savages who will stop at nothing to dominate this bracket. For my final four, I have UConn versus Arizona and Creighton versus Duke with the final UConn versus Duke and UConn winning it all. All right, this is my first time even looking at the March Madness bracket. It's the day before the tournament, sorry. I was too busy winning a state championship. Anyways, off the cuff here, here's my final four. Give me Auburn, North Carolina, Houston, and Tennessee. And with that, give me Houston winning it all. All right, I'm gonna start with my big upset and I have UConn going down in the Sweet 16 to the Auburn Tigers. Give me Auburn all the way to the final four. There they will play the Arizona Wildcats. So I got Auburn and Arizona on the left. A little chalk on the right side of the bracket. Just give me the two one seeds, Houston and Purdue. And then in the final, Purdue makes it there, but can't quite finish the job. I've got Arizona over Purdue for the national championship. What's going on, Evan Abrams, Action Network? There's nothing more American than 4th of July, March Madness. Happy America. My final four, Arizona, Houston, Creighton, Auburn. Arizona faces Houston in the title. Houston wins it all. Kelvin Sampson used to be my coach at Indiana. This is just the way it's supposed to be. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Matt Moore from the Action Network, senior NBA writer and I suppose we can talk about the children missing the jumpers on their way to whatever silly trophy they're going to get. Just kidding. Everyone loves March Madness. For my final four, I've got the Yukon Huskies first. Uh, been described as the closest thing to an NBA team in college, so yeah, I'll go ahead and I'll take the power program with the Yukon Huskies. I've got the Dayton Flyers coming out and facing them and with the Yukon advancing. 
I've got the Houston Cougars taking on the Creighton Blue Jays, number three seed out there. Plus, I'll have Houston advancing in that one. So a national championship of the UConn Huskies versus the Houston Cougars with UConn taking it home. It's boring, I know, but I'm an NBA guy. Talent matters. For the Action Network, I'm Matt Moore. Hey there, it's Chad Millman, co-host of the Favorites podcast here. My final four picks. I'm going with UConn. I'm going with Arizona. I'm going with Houston. And I'm going with Purdue. I've got UConn beating Houston in the finals to repeat as national champions in college basketball. Don't forget, everything we do here, all the stats, all the data, everything we talk about, all your favorite experts' picks are available for free in the award-winning Action Network app. Download it, check it out, enjoy it, get your winners.